and welcome to another look at our very strange world expositions this time Buffalo and the Pan American Exposition of 1901 this will be a small piece of one of the chapters that's in my book exposing the expositions ancient Rome in America by all means check the book out you can find it at Amazon and other book sellers if you like the video today Please push the like button, subscribe to the channel. It helps move these videos up on YouTube's engine so other people can find them and hopefully be interested by what's being presented. So 1901 is the next major World's Fair after the 1893 exposition in Chicago. There was a couple of fairs in between, including one in Omaha in 1898, one in Nashville in 1897. But I want to talk about Buffalo because it's, uh, it ends with a very interest. this video will end with a very interesting finding, and that is what happened to the ceiling, the dome part of the Temple of Music, where President, U.S. President McKinley was assassinated. And uh, that was recently located, and I want to share that with you as we go to the end of the video. But first, let's talk about the exposition in Buffalo which is strange in itself. I mean, it's strange to think that Buffalo would have something like this, um, given that you don't think of it as a giant World's Fair host. I mean, <clears throat> granted, yes, Buffalo did have the eighth largest population in the U.S. It was close to the tourist attraction of Niagara Falls, but Buffalo is not Paris or London or Barcelona or Chicago or the other World's Fair hosts. So also something has to make you wonder why Buffalo was chosen for this particular fair. This is the logo that was used for the Pan American Exposition. Um, it was interesting because this is just after the U.S. had won the Spanish-American War and it gained several territories in the Caribbean from it. And this fair was supposed to be in a way to glorify the new expansionist flavor that the U.S. had taken up, this idea called Pan-Americanism. And it was the idea that the U.S. should be in control of all of the Americas, North and South. And it's represented in this logo, where North and South America are symbolized by two women whose dresses form the shape of the continents, while their hands join over Central America. It was painted by Raphael Beck, who used two specially selected beauty contest winners, Maxine Elliott and, Mer and Maude Coleman Woods. Oddly, there may have been a second message in this logo, besides just the Union of North and South America. And that was Elliot came from Maine, which was a key Union state in the Civil War, while Coleman Woods came from Virginia, which was a key Southern state. So there may also be a secondary meaning into this logo. When it comes to construction photos, we see something like this, which is the supposed original blueprints to the music hall. One of the few, one of the actual flu, few uh, blueprints I've ever seen so far of any Pan American Exposition building. But the construction photos uh, are really hard to find. The Buffalo History Museum has a few, but they're, again, just like all the fairs, very strange. This one has a guy just standing in the middle of what already seems to be a complete peristyle court. The buildings are at the back. Nothing at all seems to be any kind of construction happening. Yet this is, this is listed as a construction photo for the Buffalo Exposition. Here's another one that you can find, which is, uh, again, this is the Music Hall, I believe. And again, it's just a series of scaffolding placed on which looks like a nearly complete site. Uh, you can say, oh, well, they were painting, they were doing some extra work on it, but there's nothing to indicate that anything is being built anywhere on this site. How about this building? This is part of the construction of uh, part of the areas around the electrical tower. And Again, does this look like um, temporary material? Would you be willing to trust building something like this? And in fact, having people walk up, because people would walk up to the very high points up in here where they would go to have outposts to look over the exposition. Would you really want people walking up a structure like this if it was temporary, if it was just built out of wood and plaster? I think again, this has to be a this has to be a much more solid concrete base. This has to be a much more solid piece of work, and that takes a lot of time. Here's some of the early construction workers again claimed to be uh, early in early in the building of the site. Well, we definitely do see what seem to be workers all holding their shovels, not doing very much, putting digging what looks to be either 
perhaps they're digging out something but again look at the back almost everything in the back is there it is it's complete there's some scaffolding up like they might be adding one or two things or fixing a few things or repairing things again it's photos like this that makes me think these expositions were either dug out and refurbished they were certainly not built from scratch here's another one with the interior of, uh, of a building and again we see a lot of workers in the center we do see something happening from the standpoint of the columns but again we don't know if perhaps this whole building on the outside had been standing and they're just having to redo re-put in columns that have fallen or been destroyed anyway I'll leave some of these for you to think about this is the exposition and it, while Chicago was called the white city Omaha was known as the new white city Buffalo became known as the Rainbow City. It was claimed because of that so much color was added to the buildings. Um, there was all sorts of buildings here again. The Manufacturers Building, the Liberal Arts Building, the Machines Building, the, the Transportation Building, the Agriculture, the Electrical Building. And uh, again, you, even though this was 350 acres of size, again, this was all built in less than two years. That includes not only all the buildings, that includes all of the work here on the water systems on the canals on all the all the work on the roads all the work on everything that goes into this site which will include the massive amounts of electricity that you'll see that's coming in again all in less than two years at a time with no with no modern machines no way of bringing things to and from the site it, it's it's an it's an impossible building it's an impossible building procedure to build things like this and you have to have to recall that you've got things like uh, the government building, 130 feet by, a four, by 418 feet, connected by two colonnades. How about the fishery and agriculture building? They reach 100 square feet. Uh, again, I believe this is the Temple of Music. You've got, uh, uh, you've got buildings that are 100, uh, this building is 150 feet on each side with a center dome, 180 feet outside, and 53, 53 feet 9 inches from the floor on the inside. Four major pieces of sculpture at each corner of the building, supposedly intended to symbolize the major categories of music. Again, we're going to get into the amazing electricity of the fair, because this is one of the things that's absolutely shocking, and that is, <clears throat> you, you can see just how much electricity is being generated by the Buffalo World's Fair. Everything is lit up like it's Christmas time. I mean, look at this. Um, my wife commented saying this looks like Las Vegas and how are they doing this in 1901 now it's going to be claimed when we get in to talk about this that this was all set up by Nikola Tesla and that he had come to symbolize using power from Niagara Falls in order to shift it to Buffalo so that it could be put into the World's Fair and again you have to really wonder if that is true because how exactly was that figured out? More interestingly, all this connection with Tesla is that Tesla only came to the fairgrounds once. There was only one day that he showed up at the fairgrounds and there was no information on uh, his visit. There was no photographs taken of his visit. There wasn't even a newspaper article interview done of his visit. The man who had set up this entire electrical display, this amazing ability to bring power from Niagara Falls into the city, yet he's not even acknowledged with even a small newspaper article. So again, as we go through this, you're going to see some very, very strange things about this Buffalo Fair. How about this, the center, which is known as the Electrical Tower, 395 feet high, which on top of the tower, here's a golden statue uh, called the Goddess of Light. And this, of course, mirrors the gold statue that they had in Chicago. And again, you have to wonder, something like this, are you really going to build this as a temporary structure out of wood, a little bit of steel beams and some plaster? Because again, there are people that are going up to this top area here. There are people that are going to go up there and look over the fair. Do you really want people potentially climbing up this when the whole thing collapses from being a temporary site? Again, this has to have some sort of very serious uh, construction, some very serious foundation work in order to hold this up. And again, you have to ask yourself, how were they building all this in two years at a time of no machines, no technology, no trucks to bring anything in? This is, this is the question of these fairs that are never properly answered. 
This is also very interesting because, again, we see a lot of Roman-style buildings. As I get to in the last chapter of the book of why these fairs are modeling ancient Rome, I mean, here they've basically modeled uh, a small Roman Colosseum. And this was part of the midway that existed. And there were some very strange midway events. I mean, very strange. One was the Johnstown Flood Exhibit which was a very graphic presentation of the 1899, 1889 sorry, disaster in Johnstown, Pennsylvania, in which a dam broke and 2,000, 2000, 2,200 people died. The event cost 25 cents. It ran for 30 minutes. Uh, why would you have an exhibit to show off a massive amount of deaths from a flood? On the May 4, 1901 edition of the Buffalo Times called it wonderful. And why do I think it's so important? because it may be a description of what a lot of alter alternate historians refer to as the mud flood, some sort of event that maybe not necessarily at the same time around the world and perhaps triggered by all sorts of different strange reasons that produced biblical-like floods and perhaps left cities covered in many feet of mud. So whether the Johnstown Dam itself burst or not, uh, it could be used as a story to explain the obvious flood damage that you'll see at this event. And in fact, I get the sense that the Johnstown exhibit was there to symbolically represent this destruction that had just recently happened. Okay, other things at this fair. Inside this Colosseum that you see were giant mock battles that were fought uh, with U.S. cavalry troops in the 12,000-seat stadium. It's, uh, according, to, according to what they have for the stadium, this is a quote from, the, um, a quote from one of the newspapers, built as a temporary structure the enormous stadium became a topic of speculation as the exposition's closing neared. A few wanted to maintain it as a permanent addition to the North Buffalo area, but it was owned by the exposition company and stood on leased land, so there was no serious contemplation of preserving an all-wooden structure whose decorative features were covered with staff. Like the rest of the exposition buildings, it only appeared, it only appeared substantial. So, again, this has to be, would you really build something like this out of what they're calling wood and staff, a temporary structure that wouldn't even possibly want to be sticking around for a while, but can hold 12,000 people? 12,000 people in such a small temporary structure. Again, you really have to question this. As for the battle itself that you see going on down here, it was more set up like a, what became giant 1950s Western movies. Uh, Thomas Edison even had some of it film, filmed it, and I have watched some of it. Some of the film of these battles are available right now on YouTube. And what you do see is basically two lines of sides firing shots at each other, but at no time does anyone ever pretend to be hurt or die. Um, and the Indians are there partially to show off the defeated nations just destroyed by the U.S. Army. And there were all sorts of teepees and exhibits that were set up to show their primitive tools and their primitive life to again to present the great military power of the U.S. to defeat them and the great consumer goods and the great consumer culture that the Eastern white people had that made them superior to their natives. Margaret Coleman, or sorry, Margaret Creighton wrote in her book, The Rise and Fall of the Rainbow City, this very disturbing um, quotation. The most shocking event at the exposition was the public slaughter of 700 dogs many taken from animal shelters or snatched off the streets. It was held over two days in front of 20,000 spectators. The Indian Congress, made up of several tribes, carried out the executions with Geronimo, on loan from an Oklahoma prison, killing the first dog with a bow and arrow. The dogs were then eaten. So this is again, I think, something that is there quite simply to try to show the primitive, um, savage nature of the Indians to the minds of the whites, who are, going to, who are being presented at these fairs as cultured, perfect, and high, more highly advanced. Take this very disturbing racist exhibit on the Midway. This was called the Old Plantation. And the Buffalo News described, and I'm quoting the article exactly, genuine southern darkies, 200 of them, ranging in years from wee toddling pickaninnies to Negroes, gray and bent with age, can be seen all day in the exposition at their different occupations and pastimes. Lovers of Negro melodies will have a feast. Many of the darkies will be selected because of their special talents as singers and banjo players, and they will dance and sing to the seductive tinklings of instruments exactly as the Negroes of the South used to do it on the in the long, long ago. 
The Buffalo Express also suggested, if you like to hear coon songs and dances and banjo music, go to the old plantation and spend a very pleasant hour or so. Again, this is just one photo, and if you go onto Google and search the words cakewalk and old plantation, you're going to see a lot more of this exhibit. So it's quite clear that these expositions and racism are not only tied together, that they're a key component of this idea of presenting, of elevating the white and dropping the non-white in the pecking order of the eyes of the world. That's a big part of what's going on at these fairs and it actually will get worse at the exposition in St. Louis in 1904. But let's move on to the event that <clears throat> this exposition is most known for and that is the assassination of this man, U.S. President McKinley. He was shot on September the 6th in the Temple of Music um, by, by a gentleman named Leon Kazalgs. I have trouble saying the name. What's shocking about this is that he was taken to the hospital, which, was, which had an operating area right at the fair, and the hospital had no interior lighting. Now remember the photos I just showed you with 10,000 electrical lights. There was more electrical lights at the Buffalo Exposition than in the entire city of New York, yet they didn't have any lighting inside the hospital operating room. In fact, it's claimed they had to hold up a mirror to reflect, to reflect the rays of the sun so a local doctor, who was of course not trained in such surgeries, could do the operation. So you have to again be wondering, why would something like that be set up? Why would you not have a couple of lights in the operating room just in case somebody needed it? Um, very, very disturbing type stuff. Um, oh, before I go on, I guess I should pass on some information on the trial of, of, the, of the assassin which started on September 23rd, just 10 days after the death of the president and before the exposition had even finished. And the trial lasted only two days. The two appointed attorneys basically argued nothing. They didn't even speak to the client and they called no witnesses and entered no testimony. He was quickly uh, convicted and died on the electric chair on October 29, 1901. He was then quickly uh, buried and had acid poured over his body. He had acid poured over his body. So there's almost no doubt the, the assassination was similar to the Kennedy assassination, some sort of inside job that was quickly covered up so that their new choice of leader, in this case Theodore Roosevelt, could be in charge. What's odd is that the electric chair also turned out to be a big part of the fair and is connected to the rivalry between Tesla and Edison. Edison had previously tried to show Tesla's alternating current was dangerous and it staged public electrocutions of animals, including dogs and a horse, using Tesla's technology. And Edison was also the first to use the electric chair on a prisoner in a New York prison in 1890. And in, in 11 years later, at this fair, it was Edison who was back at the same prison helping for this Xalga uh, execution of the McKinley assassin. Uh, so again, you've got this very strange connections that are going on with the fair. But there's another execution that happened or almost happened at the fair, and that was presented by this man, Frank C. Bostock, called the Animal King, a man of unbound courage and resources, before whom all animals cower. Yes, sounds like a lovely man. But it gets worse. Bostock had recently acquired Jumbo, a nine-ton elephant from the British Army, where it had been decorated by Queen Victoria for bravery in the Afghanistan Wars. So how does he treat the elephant? Bostock claimed that by the end of the fair, Jumbo would stop eating and even tried to attack him. So he decided to have the element ki elephant killed with a public execution at the fairgrounds with tickets costing 50 cents. He said that it's likely that Jumbo will be hanged or choked to death with chains, in which case other elephants will be used. Opposition to the plan was immediate from the Buffalo mayor and the fair organizers. The problem they had was not with killing the elephant, but the methods being used on the fairgrounds. They would only allow it to go on if the elephant was electrocuted. Well, this is very important. The elephant had to be electrocuted for, for it to be allowed. So Sunday, November 3rd, 7,000 people came to witness it. The elephant was set up to long electrical wires. Bostock gave a speech of Jumbo's military service and how his time in the midway caused him to become a killer. Then the switch was pulled and electricity shot through the elephant, but Jumbo did not die. The crowd almost spontaneously started to laugh, and Bostock himself promised over the din of the laughter that he would refund all the tickets. Only later did he realize that Jumbo's skin <coughs> had, the, had the effect of rubber, and the electricity was impossible, to execute, it was impossible to penetrate. So these were the people who shaped our modern world. 
the people who made who made our world made this Buffalo Fair a great example of how it's run. Slave exhibits, dog killings, attempting to electrocute prize elephants, and coordinating presidential assassinations. That's why to me the Buffalo Fair, as weird as it is, is really important for showing what our world was soon going to become, and in fact is. While the, while the McKinley assassination, uh, the fair kind of died with him at the same time. By the time the fair ended on November the 1st, even though it was called Buffalo Day, there was hopes of drawing one large crowd, but instead what happened that evening was a riot. Again, according to the newspapers, people went mad. They were seized with a desire to destroy. Destruction was carried out in the broadest manner all along the midway. Electric light bulbs were jerked from their posts and thousands of them were smashed on the ground. Some of the midway restaurants were crushed into fragments under the pressure of the mob as if, as if, they, were, as if they were so much pasteboard. But they're supposed to be pasteboard. Why would they, why would they be destroying them and, have, and the newspaper have to say as if they were pasteboard when they are supposed to be pasteboard? So apparently, it was much harder for the mob to destroy things than it really should have been. Um, policemen were pushed aside, pushed aside as if they were stuffed ornaments. The National Glass Exhibit was completely destroyed. Pap's Cafe was demolished, and Cleopatra's Needle was torn to the ground. So of course, of course this place had to have an obelisk claim uh, Cleopatra's Needle. By 1902, the fair had to be destroyed. We'll get to the, that in a minute. By 1902, the fair had begun to be destroyed. It was destroyed by Harris Wrecking Company of Chicago. So yes, they actually went to Chicago, the site of one of the last fairs, to come in and destroy the new one. A local committee was formed to buy and preserve the electric tower, the giant building you'd seen, as a lasting monument to the exposition. But supposedly, they didn't raise enough money. On January 20, 1902, the statue of the Goddess of Light was sold to the Humphrey Popcorn Company of Cleveland, and the tower was, and the tower was torn down the fair was gone. Now, a couple of things before we get to what happened to the dome I'm going to talk about. One thing I want to show you is this very strange certificate. The Pan American Exposition, Buffalo, New York, A.D. 1901. So very important, they had to put the A.D. in there, 1901, because in case you're confused with the certificate of being from 1901 B.C. And it's a commemorative diploma, as you can see down here, a commemorative diploma upon, uh, uh, and, and this one's empty, it hasn't been totally filled in, but you have to wonder, diploma of what? The directors on the recognition of the superior jury of awards confer this commemorative diploma. So you have to also have to wonder what might the what might sort of university course type thing is going on in the middle of this fair, where people could get diplomas from. And again, A.D. 1901. But let's talk about what happened to the fair. So inside the uh, Temple of Music where McKinley had been assassinated was a beautiful dome structure. And the dome, like the rest of the fair, disappeared with the, with the demolition. But I happened to be watching some YouTube clips of some people who filmed themselves exploring abandoned buildings. And in this one, they went into an old tuber tuberculosis hospital near Buffalo. The hospital was supposedly built in 1909, this one right here, and had a giant domed rotunda Okay, that's strange. So I started looking into the video and looking more and studying more on it. The hospital is called the J.N. Adam Memorial Hospital in Pennysburg, Pennsylvania. Again, supposedly built in 19, from 1909 to 1912. This is just a small part of the entrance. It's huge. And you have to start looking more deeply because once you get into the deep part of this and you start seeing this beautiful glass dome. So first, why does a tuberculosis hospital need to have such a spectacular rotunda and such a beautiful dome structure? However, yes, that very piece of glass that's here in the tuberculosis hospital was the same dome, that, the same piece of glass in the dome that was on top of the Temple of Music in the Buffalo Fair. Here's another photo of it. So yes, the place where the president was assassinated. When you looked into what, what had happened to it, it was supposedly donated as a gift to the hospital by Buffalo Mayor Adam. Huh? So that means the mayor of Buffalo kept the glass where the president was assassinated, obviously as some sort of trophy. I'm also sure that the group that had Kennedy killed has a number of souvenirs from that day as well. So this hospital was began with a souvenir of the assassination of the president. Again, it's another thing I just want to mention that when you look into these fairs, 
not only do parts of them show up in the strangest places, it shows that really these expositions have a very sick, very disturbed undertone to their whole construction, their whole presentation, their whole destruction, and the whole reason for their being. Finally, to end this off, we take this last look at the beautiful courtyard of the Buffalo Fair. And just a reminder that the fair actually lost $6 million. And it was found that the company had to default over $3.5 million in bonds. But the fair organizer claimed that the money spent was not foolish, but that the Pan American Exposition was a masterpiece and the city its chosen showcase. But Milburn did not stay in Buffalo. He quickly left for New York and set up a partnership in a law firm. So the Buffalo Fair was a money loser, had a president assassinated, racism was, racism was presented in the most foul ways, animals were murdered, and yet this was a masterpiece. You might think this would be enough to just stop the whole business of expositions finally, but no, they decided to go even bigger. They decided that the next one in St. Louis needs to be even larger than the one in Chicago. So again, Please check in with my book, Exposing the Expositions, if you want to know more about these very bizarre structures. And by all means, if you have something interesting to say about Buffalo or the Expos, leave a comment, and we can all try to research this together.